It being past 3 p.m., the debate is interrupted in accordance with Standing Order 101A. The debate may be resumed at a later hour. Questions without notice. Are there any questions, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition? Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, my question is to the Prime Minister, and I ask the Prime Minister: Is he aware of the view expressed by Professor George Winterton, a member of the Republican Advisory Committee, that if the Governor-General's powers are inherited by a Republican head of state? Since the link with the monarchy would have been severed, the present conventions governing the exercise of the reserve powers might not subsist. What is the basis of the Prime Minister's apparently confident belief that the conventions governing the reserve powers can safely travel from a Governor-General to a President, even though they are not conventions of government but conventions of the Crown? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, uh, the government uh, would, uh, would uh, and the parliament would, by, by proposal, then by referendum, uh, make clear in a referendum proposal that those powers uh, now enjoyed by the uh, governor general, so-called reserve powers, would be enjoyed by uh, the incumbent president. In which case, uh, the powers would be undefined. Uh, the alternative is to try and define the powers to say what such a person may or may not do. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the honourable gentleman will agree. Opposite uh, will agree that the difficulty in that is that all of the contingencies which go to the rights and prerogatives of the head of state versus the head of government versus the government. Uh, these questions about the rights of the Prime Minister and the Cabinet in the event, say, of a 1975 type deadlock, all of these sorts of problems would then have to be comprehended in a set of codified, uh, a set of codified arrangements. Uh, and uh, I think they are not capable, A, of being agreed uh, B, and B, uh, foreseen. So uh, it's um, the, the implication, what's implied in the question, if it's not written down, the power doesn't exist. Uh, and, uh, yeah, no, Order. And, uh, Order. Uh, no, but, uh, but the thing is, what, but my point is, my point is, if it is written in, yeah, yeah, if it is written in, it's in, even if it isn't articulated. The honourable member for Paterson. Mr. Speaker, and my question, without notice, is to the treasurer. Can the Treasurer advise the House of the importance of returning the budget to surplus and what would be the consequences of failing to achieve that outcome? The Honourable Treasurer. Uh, Mr Speaker, in response to the member for Patterson, I can say that uh, clearly it is very important to return the budget to surplus, as the government has uh, announced it will do in 95-6 uh, through uh, uh, various measures, including significant fiscal tightening and achieving a surplus of $780 million in 95-6 and uh, going out to $7.4 billion by 98-9. Now that's important, Mr Speaker, to take the pressure off interest rates because it dramatically reduces the bond selling task by some $15 billion in 95-6. Uh, the tightening of fiscal policy is anti-inflationary and so it helps us to keep a low inflation and it's also, of course, uh, the process of uh, rest restoration of budget surpluses uh, means that there is a reduction, a major reduction in public sector dissaving, uh, so a boost to national saving, less reliance on the savings of foreigners and a better balance of payments current account outcome. Now, all this, Mr Speaker, represents uh, classic counter-cyclical policy as well as an attempt to structurally improve our national savings. Now, the importance of such policy uh, can e has even been recognised Mr. Speaker, by the Leader of the Opposition who in his uh, otherwise uh, extraordinarily unnotable speech, uh, his headland speech on Tuesday night, otherwise known as his Cape Barron speech, said uh, his Cape Barron speech, uh, absolutely nothing in it. He did manage to make this commitment, though, Mr Speaker. He said uh, uh, with greater economic flexibility will reduce but not remove the need for counter-cyclical counter macroeconomic policies from time to time. So he uh, therefore said that they could see that there would be a need for counter-cyclical macroeconomic policies, and that's what, of course, the government is engaged in in, in this uh, budget, for the reasons that I've just mentioned. And subsequently, he went on to say, and to preserve policy flexibility and prudent public debt levels, 
The corollary is that the governments will need to run budget surpluses in the upswing to increase public saving, which is vital to curing Australia's current account deficit problem. So here he is uh, then committing himself to saying that uh, we should have budget surpluses in the upswing to increase public saving, which is vital to uh, addressing the current account. And Mr Speaker, that was the rhetoric, but there's an enormous gap between the windy rhetoric of the headland speech and the actual reality of opposition behaviour, because as everyone in this House knows, what the opposition is trying to do in this budget debate is uh, to prevent billions of dollars uh, of uh, deficit reduction uh, from going through. And they are doing that by, by opposing various uh, tax measures in relation to company tax, Medicare levy, building materials, cars, the PAYE remittance and the provisional tax uplift factor, the combined effect of which uh, in 1995-6 uh, would be to deprive the government of uh, some $1.5 billion of tax revenue and uh, in the following year $2.6 billion. And uh, to change the budget outcome uh, for this year from a surplus of $718 million to a deficit of $827 million, and uh, next year from a surplus of $3.4 billion to a, surplus, a much smaller surplus of $816 million. In other words, a surplus which would uh, only be a surplus because of asset sales and not what the government was trying to achieve in 96-7, a surplus without asset sales. And Mr Speaker, so therefore we see uh, on the one hand this uh, commitment in the broad, this uh, rhetoric about support uh, for, uh, for uh, responsible counter-cyclical policy and budget surpluses, on the other hand an absolute attempt to prevent that happening. Now that is just nothing more, Mr Speaker, than economic sabotage. Economic sabotage by an opposition who is prepared to say, on the one hand, trying to stand on the lofty heights, that we support appropriate policy, we stand for appropriate policy, and policy which is in the interest of the nation, but when it comes to the particular reality of measures before this House, voting time and time again to try to stop that outcome occurring. In other words, it's just complete attempt to uh, sabotage the economy, to make it more difficult in terms of the current account, uh, to make it uh, more difficult in terms of anti-inflation behaviour, and to uh, keep pressure on interest rates. They would like to see those things happen, quite clearly from their behaviour, Mr Speaker. Now, that is just an atrocious position for the opposition to be in. Now, the Leader of the Opposition wants to sort of go around and stump around the country pretending to be a man of uh, some honour and um, a man who stands for something substantial and there's a real alternative, then surely it's up to him to behave like that and, and not just to make uh, expressions of high-sounding rhetoric. Mr Speaker, when it comes to reality, what we see is an opposition which is simply unprepared to do that. And if they want to argue, Mr Speaker, that uh, the way in which it uh, should be done is through outlays, let me just say this very briefly about outlays. Outlays for 95-6 at 25.1 per cent of GDP are 3.5 per cent of GDP below what they were when we came into office. 3.5 per cent of GDP, less than they were when the now Leader of the Opposition was Treasurer. 3.5 per cent of GDP. Outlays as a percentage of GDP in 95-6 are lower than in any year when the now Leader of the Opposition was Treasurer. And outlays are projected to drop to 24 per cent of GDP by 98-9 from their current 25.1 per cent in 95-6. That is almost 2 per cent of GDP less than in any year when uh, the uh, now Leader of the Opposition was Treasurer. So, Mr Speaker, outlays are not extravagant. They are tight, but they are very well targeted to those in need. And if the Opposition want to say that we should be slashing outlays rather than raising taxes, then that means they have to face up to the fact that they would be taking uh, amounts away from people in need, from the very people that they now say that they are concerned about. And in respect of battlers, let me just uh, conclude on this point, Mr Speaker, that uh, the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition in his speech on Tuesday night revealed all by this sentence. He said, I might add that Menzies would have smiled to himself as I did when after a week of us fighting for the interests of the Australian battler. A week. And that's about how long it is, Mr Speaker, when a poll-driven analysis says, hey, fight for the battler, there might be something in that, then that's what they do for a week. 
stand up and say, well, you know, we're here to defend the battler. It wasn't there. That wasn't the reality in government. It's not the reality in anything that's been said by the opposition uh, to this point in time, Mr Speaker. And what is clear is that it's this government which stands for the people in need, and the defence of outlays demonstrates that. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr uh, Speaker, I have another question for the Prime Minister. Uh, and supplementary to the first question I asked him, and I remind the Prime Minister that my first question was not directed to the question of whether or not the reserve powers should be explicitly spelt out in a Republican constitution, but whether it was possible to transfer from our present constitution to a Republican constitution reserve powers of the Crown and conventions of the Crown as distinct from the conventions of government. And I remind uh, the Prime Minister that Professor George Winterton, uh, in the article to which I referred in my first question, said, and I quote, so a Republican constitution cannot simply continue the present constitutional position of conferring powers on the head of state in general terms relying on the constitutional conventions to govern their exercise. I ask the Prime Minister specifically, is it your intention to include in your Republican constitution a clause, a clause specifically providing that the reserve powers exercised by the head of state shall not be justiciable before the High Court? Honourable Prime Minister. Very definitely, Mr. Speaker. Very definitely. Uh, because, uh, 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 Mr. Speaker, uh, I don't believe that the uh, the High Court should be adjudicating on matters of political dispute. I've made that point over and over again. Well, okay. As soon as you think I've given you an answer, you're you're grateful for, you give me one. You give me one. I don't. I've got a simple one order, for you. Order. That is, and you can tell us tonight order. whether you think an Australian should be our head of state. Simple enough. Simple enough. I mean, simple enough. Order. You know. Order. Those on my right. Whether you think an Australian should be Member our head of prospects. state. I mean, Mr. Speaker, it's it's not it's not it's not a complex or outrageous question. Simple enough, isn't it? Whether he thinks. An Australian should be our head of state. That's the, the central question that the Leader of the Opposition has to address himself to this evening. Order. The member, the member yes, for sir. Warringah obviously has been well Mr. received Speaker, as a point of order. Standing Order 74 says that we should show respect to the Governor-General. The Prime Minister is suggesting that the Governor General is not an Australian citizen, and I suggest that you. No, will, there's you no point of order. If, if, if the Honourable Member for Warringah wants to be a little clever with taking points of order, I shall also be clever. The Leader of the Opposition, I think the Leader of the Opposition, asked a very serious question. The Prime Minister was responding. Mr. 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 Speaker, Mr. Speaker, no, I've given him an answer on both fronts. Mr. Speaker, I've made it very clear that I don't believe that if uh, these powers are expressly articulated in the Constitution, they will become other than matters and rules of law and will end up being justiciable. And that will mean you'll be asking justices of the High Court to decide matters. Take 1975. Was there anything particularly wrong with the supply bill? Was there a technical dispute? Well, of course there wasn't. The opposition of the day wanted to drive the government of the day to an election at the time of its choosing. That was what it was all about. And why would that matter then be? Why would that matter be then put in the hands of McKellar. the Chief Justice or judges of the High Court? And that's the point we made very clear last night. But, Mr. Speaker, let me say these are matters which the Australian public are entitled to think about. It's part of what I call the debate which has ensued from last night's statement, and that's why I welcome the Leader of the Opposition's questions. But what I do want him to say is where he stands on that core point. Does he believe an Australian should be our head of state? That is the, that is the central point. And let me say, Mr Speaker, no amount of obfuscation or indecision or talking about peoples or constitutional conventions, a sort of black hole that has in it uh, the external affairs power, or the power of the Senate, and all these other questions will, will, will obviate 
uh, the need for him to say where he stands on the central issue. And Mr. Speaker, it's just worth recording again that one of his fellows uh, in, the, in the Premier of Victoria had a few things to say about these things. He said, I think last night's speech, while it won't be agreed by the all, for Melbourne and the member for Wales. won't be agreed to by all, sets a blueprint for a discussion. And he said, um, you've got to understand, a great number of this community are young people who do not have the same historical reference point back to the UK. We have a large number of ethnic community members who have come from, the, from republics, in fact, other sorts of societies. And I think there is a growing recognition that this is an issue that this issue is going to be resolved. Now he goes on. Now th that will be done through a referendum, through a referendum, and the public, each and every one of us, will be able to make our own decision. Well, he's dead right. And he goes on to say, um, he said um, it, that it is only going to be able to really express. This is he got asked about. What do you think, Mr. Howard? Why do you think Mr. Howard is supporting a people's convention? And he goes on to say that, um, that this is only going to be able to really express their personal views. They may argue they represent a greater number of people, but finally this is going to be decided by each and every one of us. A convention to me is just another committee. There is not much point calling out 400 people out of a community of 18 million, sitting them down and saying, now what do you think? Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, that's precisely what, that's precisely, Mr. Speaker, that was the burden of my remarks last night. That, that is, Mr. Speaker, that the greatest uh, act of, of expressive democracy here is the referendum, and and a proposal for a constitutional change must come through this chamber. It cannot be conferred upon any sort of uh, constitutional committee. Or convention, it must come here. And, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, when when pressed about this in the past, Order. the coalition Order. have said, when asked of them, well, would you accept the results of a so-called uh, convention and put it put it absolutely to a referendum? Oh no, no, we'd reserve the right to make our own decision about it. In other words, in other words, they're consigning they're consigning a a convention to basically a talk shop, and as Jeff Kennett says, I might say very eloquently, <laughs> very eloquently. Um, you know, there's not much point, he says, calling out 400 people out of a community of 18 million and calling them the people, and calling them the people, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I think that's 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 as uh, as clear an answer I think as can be given to this. Uh, this smoke screen. I mean, Mr. Speaker, Order. Let, Mr. Order. Speaker, let me conclude on this point. Order. There's only one answer to Mayor, question relax. to be answered here: whether an Australian person should be the head of state. And no smothering that with the blanket of a convention by the leader of the opposition will disguise that question. The honourable member for Page. My question is to the minister for employment, education, and training. Can the minister inform the House of the data released today by the Australian Bureau of Statistics about the Australian labour force? What implications does that data have for the government's working nation initiatives? The Honourable Minister for Employment, Education and Training. I thank the Honourable Member for his question, Mr Speaker. And today's labour force uh, survey figures confirm in trend terms the continued improvement in the Australian labour market. In trend terms, the unemployment rate fell to 8.4 per cent, the lowest since December of 1990, and the trend unemployment rate Mr. Speaker, has fallen in every month since, the August, since August 1993. In other words, for almost two years, the trend rate has been coming down. In seasonally adjusted terms, the figures show today that employment fell by 21,400, and unemployment rose by 8 to 8.5 per cent, but the fall in employment this month Mr. Speaker, represents a modest correction from the extraordinary jump of more than 90,000 in April and, I might say, is at the lower end of market expectations. I might also observe, Mr. Speaker, for those who are shortly on the other side, that this correction this month is consistent with the recent pattern whereby we have seen very large increases in employment in one month, followed by very small corrections 
in the following month. That's why the trend, as well as the actual figures, have continued to come down. In fact, over the last two months, Mr Speaker, there has been a net increase in total employment of 69,000 jobs, all of it full-time jobs. I might also observe, in terms of the figures today, that female full-time employment rose by a further 8,800 and is now at an all-time high, and the participation rate remained at the very high 63.7%. A, very, a, a healthy sign, I might observe, Mr Speaker, of a strong labour market. So all of these figures are consistent with us achieving the working nation targets. It is true that the jobs growth has been slowing, but off huge growth that no one ever expected could be achieved. But what is also consistent when these figures come out, Mr Speaker, is the pattern of opposition response, because last month when there was the huge employment growth, they were out there predicting interest rate rises. This month, when we've had a fall that's observed by the markets to be a correction, they're telling us that the rate of employment growth is slowing and we're back into recession. The problem for that side, of course, is that they want to carp and criticise, but they don't want to offer constructive solutions. Where was the reference in the headland speech to employment and training? Was it one? Even in the things that matter, we had a whole chapter devoted to it, but it's dropped off the agenda over there, probably because the shadow minister is incapable of putting the policies together. Order. No policies on employment Order. and unemployment. Goldstein. No commitment to the youth training initiative or working nation, and despite the fact that we've got members of the National Party putting on record in the parliament their support for initi initiatives under the working nation initiative, the member for Lyme very perceptive member because he's getting behind these initiatives. They want them supported. But where is their mention on your side? None at all. No commitment to the training wage. Your approach is to cut youth wages. It's to force young people off the dole. And for those who haven't been, haven't been able to uh, get off the, uh, the benefit, you'll wash your hands of them and refer them to the voluntary organisations. The simple fact of the matter remains, Mr Speaker, that we have created 610,000 jobs in the last two years. We have increased since 1983 the total number of jobs in the economy by 2 million, 2 million jobs and 610,000 in the last two years. John Howard, when he was Treasurer of the Coalition Government, could manage only 262,000 in five and a half years. Get the comparison. Do you understand the difference between our approach on job creation and yours? Ours produces 610,000 in two years, two million in the 12 years, and your miserable performance, 262,000 jobs in a whole five and a half years. Well done. Little wonder you can't put a policy together now. I might say, Mr Speaker, I'm told today I will wind it up on this point. Order. Order. I was told today, Mr Speaker, of a conversation overheard in the corridors, a conversation involving the member for Mayo. And it went like this. He asked the person what were the figures, obviously referring to the unemployment figures. The response, they're up. Alexander Downer, that's good. But he's seen saying it's good and he says, no, I mean it's bad. Now we all know how he can change his mind. But the simple fact remains, Mr Speaker, that when it comes to employment, the opposition has no policies. All they've got is hope that the figures will go bad for us. Well, they're not going bad for us, and they'll continue to improve. The honourable member for Gippsland. Mr Speaker, my question without notice is to the Prime Minister. Will you confirm that any of the estimated three million Australians who hold dual citizenship will be able to be elected to the office of President of Australia. The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker uh, the qualification I made clear last night. If you're an Australian citizen, you qualify. The Honourable Member for Morton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Communications and the Arts. Would the minister inform the House about actions to promote Australian Order. content in commercial television? Would he explain? Order, order, order. Start again. 
Yes, if you've got another question on my left, save it till it's your turn. The member for, the member for Morton has the call. No, you won't. You'll just sit there and listen. The member for Morton. Thank you, Mr. I warn the member for Mayo. My question is to the Minister for Communications and the Arts. Would the minister inform the House about actions to promote Australian content on commercial television? Would he explain how these actions will benefit Australians and help position Australia to take advantage of the broader developments in the communications sector? Is the minister aware of any recent assessments of the communications revolution? And would he advise the House about the implications of any such assessments? The Honourable the Minister for Communications and the Arts. Mr. Speaker. Australia is uh, one of the few countries that can claim to have a very innovative public broadcasting sector through the ABC and SBS, as well as a very dynamic commercial television sector, Mr. Speaker, all of whom are very strongly committed to producing good Australian content. Yesterday, the Australian Broadcasting Authority released its new standard for Australian content on commercial television, and the new rules will strengthen the Australian presence on our television screens. This new standard by the ABA is the result of intensive consultations with broadcasters, program makers, members of the public, and it, of course, uh, with commercial television being the most influential sectors of broadcasting in Australia, this is a, a very pivotal debate. It will help, I believe, Mr. Speaker, by increasing the level of Australian content on television, help make sure that we're continuing to develop and protect Australia's identity as seen on television, and in particular to make sure that the, the shape of kids' dreams in particular are, uh, are influenced in the, the right manner on television. Now, This new standard, first of all, provides for an increase in the minimum annual level of Australian content to 55 per cent, which is to be achieved by the commercial broadcasters by 1998. But most importantly of all, there will be a doubling in the level of new Australian children's drama by 1998. And Australia already has a, very, a tremendous reputation throughout the world for producing quality children's drama on television. We've got series such as The Winners, which has been seen on 82 countries around the world. We've seen Round the Twist on 45 countries around the world, as well as uh, the, the series Lift Off, which has been picked up by the Fox Network in the United States as well as many other countries. And last week, Mr Speaker, I, when I was in Seoul for a meeting of APEC communications ministers, one of the US Federal Communications Commissioners went out of her way to praise Australia for the fact that we're leading the way with many countries in producing quality children's drama on television. And that's something which all of us can be very proud of. The, uh, the new rules, the new standard proposed by the ABA also provides for a simplified Australian content test, so that will provide some assistance to the broadcasters in calculating their obligations. So what we'll see, Mr Speaker, is the viewers will benefit by more Australian content and, in particular, the kids will benefit by more quality Australian children's drama on television. We'll see the program makers benefit by an increase in their production slates, as well as seeing benefits for the broadcasters by the introduction of a simplified system. This, uh, this, this commitment to improving the level of Australian content on television goes side by side Mr. Speaker, with the government's assistance to the film and television industry, assistance to the Australian Film Commission to Film Australia, assistance to, uh, to the film, television and radio school, as well as our commitment in Creative Nation to provide $60 million to uh, initiate a television production fund to, of course, and of course enhance the, the quality of Australian programming independently of these local content obligations. And in Creative Nation last year, Mr Speaker, we also made commitments for new multimedia, $45 million for the Australian multimedia enterprise, a commissioning of 10 CDs for the Australia on CD program. So it demonstrates quite clearly, Mr Speaker, that across the board the government's making a very firm commitment to our creative industries. Now in contrast, in contrast, the opposition, opposition leader's speech, the headland speech last Tuesday, did make some comments on the communications and the arts portfolio. And those comments were made under the headline, The Communications Revolution. So while the government's produced Creative Nation, the Communications Future Project reports, the BSEG report, Networking Australia's Future, which in total would would, would make up documents this thick, Mr Speaker, the opposition's contribution that thick could be. The opposition's contribution is not documents that thick. It's not a series of proposals to help, help us creative Australians. It's 12 paragraphs. 12 paragraphs from the Leader of the Opposition. Is it any wonder we call it 
point, point missing, point missing, the headland speech. And the reason why we say it's point missing is that in those 12 paragraphs, the only comment the Leader of the Opposition could offer our creative industries, the, the only offer of assistance the Leader of the Opposition could put forward for our film and television makers and our artists is that he believes the communications revolution will, will be part of the Howard Costello Industrial Relations Laboratory. So all of those filmmakers and screenwriters and, and, and the performing artists and the visual artists, they're going to be inputs to your industrial relations laboratory. Well, if that's not the case, why couldn't you say anything else about our cultural industries other than it gets down to industrial relations? And it's probably no surprise, Mr Speaker, given that the spokesman on communications for the opposition has said that government assistance to the creative industries is a waste of money. It's money down the drain. And the deputy leader of the opposition has said that for the government to have a policy on the arts is a joke. So it's no wonder, Mr Speaker, that we can see that there's no difference between the views advocated by the Leader of the Opposition or the Deputy Leader of the Opposition or their spokesman on communications. They have, they have no commitment to Australia's cultural industries and no understanding of the tremendous possibilities that these industri industries can deliver Australia. The Honourable, Mem oh, the Honourable uh, Leader of the National Party. Thank you, Mr Speaker. To bring further focus to the reserve powers issue, my question is directed to the Prime Minister, and I ask. Does the Prime Minister accept that his statement last night was nothing less than a complete and absolute vindication of Sir John Kerr, who used the reserve powers, which you have deliberately left intact, to Order. sack the most monumentally incompetent government in Australia's history, the Labor government of Gough Whitlam? I wish you remember. Order. You were too. Order. Minister. Mr. Those Speaker, my right. I ask. The Prime Minister, are those who maintain the rage wrong? I ask, will the Labor Party, for you as Prime Minister, apologise to the family of Sir John Kerr Order. for making him the Prime a Minister, social I think he's trying to hear the question up until the time of his death? Mr Speaker, I ask the Prime Minister, do you accept that by not codifying the reserve powers, you have condemned Labor's whole approach to the complex issues surrounding November 1975 being completely and utterly absurd. At the end of that great century of change in Europe, the 18th century, when the French Revolution came and the great, the great revolution and the great revolution Order. In, uh, Order. and the great revolution Those in the United left. States came with the American War of Independence. Order. And, uh, Deputy Leader of the Opposition knows better. And the American War of Independence, where where that uh, fight was led uh, by uh, the first American president, uh, the great soldier statesman George Washington, when the designers of that constitution sat down to. Uh, Sat down, to write the, uh, sat down to write that, write that uh, constitution, they severely constrained the powers of the American presidency and divided it between the presidency, the legislature and the Supreme Court. That is, despite the huge force of the political force running right through that century down to the last quarter of it and winning a war of independence, there was still substantial constraints on American executive presidential authority. No such similar constraints existed in the transfer of powers from the English monarchs to the British Prime Minister and after 1901 to the Australian Prime Minister and Cabinet. But part of the check always was that there would be in the hands of the monarch, in the hands of the monarch, a power to look over the operation of, of the government with this power. In our system, there was another one. That is, because our constitution was written in 1901 and not 1913, after the House of Lords, with the Asquith Lloyd George budget, defeated, defeated the, the House of Lords uh, in uh, 1911 or 1912. Mr. Speaker, defeated the, uh, defeated the. Um, if I had a jelly bean, I'd give you one. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker um, uh, no, I would, Mr. Speaker. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be mean or beastly to him at all. Uh, Mr. Speaker, 
Now, if, if uh, Mr. Speaker, as a consequence of that and the fact that the House of Lords dared the monarch to appoint so, so many people as to render its power to refuse a budget redundant, and the King made clear that he would support the government in the House of Commons, even though it was ruling with a majority, uh, um, uh, over the coalition of Irish nationalists, the fact of the matter is what happened was that the power of the House of Lords was broken. Our constitution was written in 1901, and we've ended up with a very powerful second chamber. We implemented in 1901, and we ended up with a very powerful. Well, Those on answer, my left. Order. I mean, you answer, or don't you? Mr. Mr. Order. Mr. Speaker, we ended, up, uh, we ended up with a very powerful second chamber. So there are a number of checks in this system. The powerful second chamber. The powerful second chamber and these reserve powers, which existed and have been in the hands of, of the vice regal figure, the Queen's deputy, the Governor General. Now, nothing about those powers or the fact that Sir John Kerr had them available to him as the incumbent meant that the powers were illegitimate. What was illegitimate was the way he used them. Was the way he used them. Sir John, what Sir John Kerr did was deceive his Prime Minister by not, by not, telling, him, by not telling him that unless he advised him of an election or could guarantee supply, he would swear in someone he knew the House of Representatives did not have confidence in. That's it. That, was his, that was the crime against Sir John Kerr. And, uh, or letting the dispute run its course, because those of us who were around in 1975 know that, that if the dispute had gone on again. a couple more days, the likelihood is Malcolm Fraser wouldn't even have been leader of the opposition. That is, that is that there would have been a complete, a complete cave-in in the Senate, a complete cave-in in the Senate, and of course the supply bill would have passed, and the whole, the whole matter would have passed, and, and the then opposition may well have won the subsequent election 18 months later. But of course, Malcolm Fraser lost that legitimacy he was always looking for, and it was permanently denied him as a consequence. It was also, Mr. Speaker, it was also denied. He was also it was all, that same legitimacy was also denied to Sir John Kerr. And Mr. Speaker, let me say, I think that's been a very salutary exercise uh, in what I described last night as one of the checks on a head of state. That is, someone who determines upon a course of action he or she knows to be controversial, they need to understand that the action is both warranted and capable of being defended. And if it is not warranted and capable of being defended, then they will have to wear the, appro the opprobrium of public opinion. And uh, that is beyond the other checks, which are that either House that either House, by simple majority, can command a joint sitting to either seek to remove or censure the head of state. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, in the model the government is putting forward, we're not in any way. There is no link in the question between the existence of the reserve powers and Sir John Kerr's use of them, which makes anybody who argued against Sir John Kerr's use argue that there's, the powers are illegitimate. No one's ever argued that. Gough Whitlam's not arguing that yesterday. He's not even arguing that yesterday. Uh, he, he, uh, he understands, I think, the power, the power which has been conferred upon uh, prime ministers and cabinets in the Westminster system, and he's understood, understood the reserve power which existed in the hands of the monarch and, in this case, her deputy. But that in no way illegitimised those powers. What made it illegitimate was the fact that the power was abused, and it was, ab it was abused uh, by a Governor General uh, who refused to tell his Prime Minister what he had in mind. And, uh, as you know, I was, I was with Gough Whitlam on the last occasion he saw uh, Sir John Kerr, the very last occasion, that afternoon, and I, let me assure you Order. there was no attempt by him, no attempt by him whatsoever to tell the then Prime Minister what he had in mind. And so he swore in Malcolm Fraser. Malcolm Fraser, Malcolm Fraser then had to wear a, a, a loss of confidence, a lack of confidence motion, a no confidence motion in the House of Representatives, and, uh, and then, Mr. Speaker, uh, the Governor General refused to see the Speaker of the House of Representatives. When, when the head of state got down to refusing to see the, 
the, the, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, uh, when he got down to uh, refusing to see uh, the, uh, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, you knew basically, in moral terms, the game was up for him and has been up for him ever since. Before I call the member for Charlton, the member for Maranoa is making a habit of conversing across the chamber. Can I suggest he reviews his ways? Honourable <coughs> Member Charles. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, my, <coughs> my, Mr. Speaker, my question is directed to the Prime Minister. I ask the Prime Minister, in the context of the substantial and creative initiatives which his government has taken, could he inform the House of the results uh, of, uh, consultation, of, of, of consultation with uh, and the response to? Uh, representatives of ordinary Australians uh, in the Australian community. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, I always find this a curious argument that the opposition puts that, uh, that uh, in a representative democracy representation is illegitimate. In a representative democracy, the Leader of the Opposition stated baldly in his headland, so called headland speech that, that representation is illegitimate. Uh, for instance, he talked about uh, what are the groups, and he, he then said the environment, the ACTU. Well, let's, say, for instance, say that the people who seek to protect the natural environment of Australia had not made their position clear over the years. The picture we could paint would be the Franklin River would be submerged under a dam. There would be fewer rainforests in the wet tropics. Fraser Island would probably now have been destroyed. Uh, and, uh, and, many other, and many other great areas. Oh, I mean, no. Mr. Speaker, Those I, mean, on Mr. My Speaker I mean, the gall of these interest groups, how dare they express a view about these things? And how dare the government respond to them, you see? Uh, how dare the government respond to them? Uh, or, 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 for instance, or, for instance, the women's organisations. I mean, I mean, equal pay for equal work, childcare, uh, the maternity allowance. Uh, the current Commonwealth focus and policy attentions to violence in the community and the protection, the protection of women against violence. I mean, these are issues which have arisen because of views put by women's organisations around this country. And uh, I mean, are, are they are they an interest group, a rabid interest group, with uh, unreasonable access to the government, groups representing half the population? Shocking! 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 Then we've got the ACTU. I mean, they, they have. Uh, this is where, of course, most of the Leader of the Opposition's bile has been reserved, not only now but over the years. But haven't we all benefited from the industrial peace, the wage restraint, the job growth, and the industrial relations reforms that have occurred over those 12 years? Before the accord, Mr. Speaker, under the Fraser Howard work government, working days lost per thousand workers from industrial disputes averaged 590. Since the accord, this number has fallen by 70 per cent. And, uh, and the, uh, the, the Minister for Employment, uh, Education and Training made a point earlier about the, the, the huge multiples of employment growth which have come from these policies compared to, a co to coalition's times. And, and, so for, and so for meeting the government and speaking with the government and joining the government productively, over 12 years to have a better industrial relations scene, higher levels of productivity, lower levels of inflation, higher levels of employment growth, it seemed to be on the, on the part of the opposition leader unseemly, an undue, an undue right from another so-called rabid interest group, uh, or the fact that Mr. Speaker, we've got inflation between 2 and 3 per cent when it was at over 10 under him. Or let's say, take some others. ACOS, the Australian Council of Social Services, the Salvation Army, the Brotherhood of St Lawrence, the St Vincent de Paul, all these welfare agencies who have shown uh, interest in the plight of, uh, of people uh, in uh, desperate positions, either homeless or, or uh, needing, needing family support. Uh, they come out explicitly supporting all of the ones I mentioned, the Job Compact, to get long-term unemployed people back to work. The job compact described by the OECD a week ago as an, in an innovative, equitable and economically efficient labour market reform. I mean, 
what a what a gall. Are they the rabid interest groups the leader of the opposition is referring to? Are they not entitled to put a view about about their constituency as they see it? Or, for instance, what about the National Farmers Federation? I mean, what a shocking hide they had to come to the government and talk about income support for people in, in uh, drought-affected areas. Uh, and uh, and the, government, the government going out listening to them, Order. understanding the problem and removing, and removing the farm assets test for the, support of, uh, for the support of income, which has now gone to 10,000 farm families. Or the rural adjustment scheme, which is going to help farms aggregate and allow some people to get off their properties to see we've got more economic units, or, the, or, or drought proofing farms in the future by measures which will support water uh, and fodder storage. I mean, are these rabid interest groups? Mr. Speaker, it's only someone who has such an elitist view of the world who wants to govern by press release, which was way it, the way it was in the 70s, the way it was under the uh, Fraser Howard regime where neither business nor labour were consulted, where the welfare agencies and the voluntary agencies were regarded as, as so irrelevant uh, that uh, they went on to, uh, they went on to uh, behave in this way. So, Mr Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker when, uh, when you see the Leader of the Opposition come out with this speech, this headland speech, this collection of junk, this collation of rubbish, and, uh, and, and try and put it across Order. and try Order. and put it across as policy and try and put it across as policy and then attack people as rabid interest groups for having the temerity to participate in our representative democracy, I say, Mr Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition is a long way off the mark of the, of the uh, thought process of this community and what they require from a representative parliamentary system. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I direct my question to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister will be aware that before 1949 there were five occasions on which a government had a majority of more than two thirds of the combined Houses of Parliament by virtue of the then voting system. Order. The Prime Minister will also be aware that the Electoral Act can be changed by a simple majority of both Houses of Parliament. What assurance is there in the Prime Minister's Republican proposals? that changes to the Electoral Act by a government controlling both houses would not produce the appointment of a president, which would be a blatantly political appointment. Yeah. The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I mean, let, let's just leave the proposals of last night to one side. And at any stage, at any stage, a government can propose a change to the Senate's voting system. At any stage. So what's, uh, what's the reference to the uh, Republic, uh, for God's sake? Uh, well, well, no, no, order, order. Well, 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 order the, well the member Mr. Mayor, you've Mr. asked your question. Mr Speaker, even if senators were elected at large, say they were elected from constituencies, say they were elected from constituencies, you, you would have a House roughly half the size of the House of Representatives. That's what the Constitution says, doesn't it? That's right. So therefore, so therefore, so therefore, so therefore, uh, so therefore two, thirds, two thirds of the whole, that is, of the House of Representatives and the Senate, is, as far as I understand it, two thirds. And, and uh, therefore, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, maybe I've missed it, but what is the point? If, if the point, but let me make, let me make another point, Mr. Speaker. But let me, let me, let me nail, let me bang the nail right into the wall with this point. Apparently, in, in, in the implication of the question, he said, the questioner says, on five occasions before 1949, governments could have secured a two-thirds majority. My view is, and somebody said Malcolm Fraser was one seat away securing it in 1975. If community opinion is such that they have entrusted the parliamentary process to one political force commanding a two-thirds majority, that force is entitled to say. Who, uh, who, should be, who should be the Order. nominee, Order. Uh, who should be the head of state. And, uh, uh, but, 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 uh, but, but, but the likelihood is, well, why would it, well, why wouldn't it, well, why would it not be? If community, opinion, if community opinion in the country was so strong for one political force or another, why should a minority with less than a third of that joint sitting 
with less than a third of that joint sitting, have the final say then about who should be the head of state. So, I mean, I mean, I, I would have thought, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I would have thought that uh, that most of the people in this house believe that when you get the 50% plus one in a democracy, you have some rights. At 50% plus one, you've got you've got some substantial majority support. We're saying more than that. We're saying two thirds, two thirds of the joint sitting of both houses. And, in a, and, and apparently they're arguing over here, Mr. Speaker, that uh, that apparently they're arguing if uh, if the co if the co if the coalition have had a, a would have had two thirds of a majority in both houses in 1975, it would have been dreadful for them to nominate and elect the head of state and elect the head of state and elect the head of state. That would have been a dreadful thing. Well, I mean, I'm surprised they have so so little pride in themselves that they should that they should argue that, or, Mr. Speaker, that they should be so ridiculous as to argue that, so ridiculous and so puerile as to argue that, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there's only one answer we want to know in this house. There's only one question. In the end, whether the leader of the opposition believes. An Australian should be our head of state. That's the key question. That's the central question. Let's get, Mr. Speaker, let's get that right. The rest will fall into place. Goodwill will put the rest into place. Honourable Member for Capricorn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Schools, Vocational Education and Training. In view of the budget and your recent meeting with state training ministers, would the minister advise the House of Developments and opportunities for young Australians to gain skills which will assist our industries to be competitive in the global uh, marketplace? Honourable Minister for Schools, Vocational Education and Training. Mr Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for Capricornia for her question. The uh, budget underlined the Commonwealth's commitment to expanding vocational education and training with confirmation of growth funding of $70 million for the Australian National Training Authority in 1996 and a further $70 million for 1997. These funds will go to the states and territories, contingent of course, on the maintenance of their own effort as required by the Andrew Arrangements. As members might expect, ministers from the states and territories were very happy with this uh, when we met recently as the Anti-Ministerial Council. The additional funding for 1996 brings the Commonwealth's total recurrent funding for vocational education and training through ANTA to $640 million. From the beginning of first term 1996, 300,000 students will have a, a place in TAFE. That's 300,000 over and above what the states provide due to the policies of this government. The Commonwealth's total annual increase for 1996 under the ANTA agreement is $380 million and it raises the Commonwealth's share of total recurrent funding for vocational education and training from 7 per cent in 1991 to an estimated 27 per cent in 1996. Since the uh, Prime Minister announced the establishment of ANTA back in 1992, the Commonwealth's funding for growth alone in the period 93 to 97 will amount to more than $1.5 billion. Mr Speaker, when this government came to office, only one in three young people finished school. We had a TAFE system which was in total disrepair and we had a higher education system which was reserved for the privileged few. In recent weeks, uh, members opposite have discovered battlers. But, Mr Speaker, if we ever had a class of real battlers, it was those young Australians who wanted an education when the coalition was in government. Back then, uh, young people were denied the education and training opportunities that might have given them a fair go. And like others, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I, perused the, uh, I perused the Cape Barren scrolls to see what young people in the future might expect under a coalition administration. And I've got to tell you that the, uh, the pickings are pretty slim, Mr. Speaker. There's only one reference, one reference of any substance to education in the Cape Barren speech. And, uh, and that was to what Bob Menzies had to say about his achievements in higher education at his farewell press conference back in 1996. Apart from that, you won't find in 1966, 30 years ago. Apart from, 
go back. Apart from that, Mr. Speaker, you won't find a mention of education in the Cape Barron speech. It's, uh, it's quite clear that the Leader of the Opposition these days has as little interest in education now as he had back in 1989 when he refused the post of Opposition Spokesman for Education because he considered it beneath him. Because he considered it beneath him. Things haven't changed. Mr. Uh, Mr Speaker, since the government came to office, Australia has witnessed school retention rates reaching three in four. Last year, an additional 90,000 young Australians completed Year 12 due to the policies of this government. And thanks to Commonwealth funding through ANTA, these young people now have a much greater choice beyond school. They have access to training in the skills that industry wants for the workforce of the future. The government recognises that Australia's future lies with its educated and its skilled people. This government has recognised the need to provide access to education and particularly the urgent need to upgrade vocational education and training. Honourable Member for Barker. Mr. Speaker, my question is uh, to the Minister of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs. I refer to the Minister's decision to ban the Hindmarsh Island Bridge on the basis of women's business. Minister, is Dorothy Wilson telling the truth when she says that women's business in relation to Hindmarsh Island was fabricated with the help of a white lawyer? Are uh, Dulcie Wilson or Bertha Gollan and the other women telling the truth when they support the story of the falsification of women's business? Is the letter from the 89-year-old matriarch Laura Cartonieri denying the existence of women's business true? Was her retraction a little later of that letter denying women's business done on her own volition? Why did Doug, Doug Miller say on TV on June the 6th and yet, yet again yesterday the last thing he said on that radio interview, I think the whole issue of the women's beliefs was fabricated. Why did Sarah Miller say on the 7th of June that the secret women's business was fa fabricated? And why did you wait so long to announce an inquiry which you seem to have done some hours after the Premier of South Australia wrote to you this morning by fax telling you that he had to decide, decided to call his own inquiry, that with Royal Commission powers, into this appalling situation? The Honourable Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs. Mr Speaker, uh, we have a question from the acknowledged cream of the South Australian Liberal establishment, and we know full well uh, the member why he's called the member for O'Connor is not required to comment. <laughs> Mr. You Mr. Speaker, are not required to comment. Mr Speaker, the, the member asks a number of questions, and I'll endeavour to answer briefly. As well, I, well, Mr. Speaker, I'll endeavour to answer the question as best I can, but some things need to be put on the record. The first uh, thing that ought to be said uh, is that the uh, Premier of South Australia and indeed the Liberal and National parties in this parliament would never dare to treat the spiritual beliefs of non-Indigenous Australians the way that they are treating the spiritual beliefs of Aboriginal people. I think it needs to be understood. I think it needs to be understood, Mr. Speaker, what a horrendous consequence it is for Australian values for a Premier of a state to commission a royal commission with all the draconian powers that that implies into the spiritual beliefs of a number of Australians. And I pose the question, I pose the question uh, to other religious faiths and beliefs in this country uh, how they would feel if a state premier were to commission a royal commission uh, indeed uh, into their spiritual beliefs. This is a very serious matter and goes far beyond an issue involving my portfolio and I'm sure that a number of people in the government will be saying some things about this in weeks to come. But of course what we're seeing here is a wave of political, uh, politically inspired royal commissions emanating from the Indian Ocean and sweeping eastward across the country. So I suppose we shouldn't be, to be surprised. But I have to say, Mr Speaker, that this is a very serious matter, and I am not, in the course of my remarks, uh, going to comment uh, more about that royal commission, except to say this, that the royal commission uh, I think poses great threats uh, to the proper uh, management and administration of government in South Australia. It is very much an abusive process of the executive government in South Australia, and indeed the Prime Minister uh, will be writing, if he has not done so already, to the Premier of South Australia, asking him to think again uh, in respect of this Royal Commission and to cooperate uh, with the, uh, the inquiry I have announced today 
uh, under proper processes That's through the skirt. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act to be conducted by Her Honour, Jane, uh, Honour Justice Jane Matthews, President of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal and the Deputy President of the National Native Title Tribunal. Now, the first point to make about the inquiry that I have announced today is that uh, arrangements for the conduct of this inquiry were put in place prior, prior uh, to the announcement by Premier Brown of a Royal Commission. And it ought to be, it ought to be understood, it ought to be understood, it ought to be, it ought to be, it ought to be understood, Mr. Speaker. The, the, the Those basis on my left, the member for Fisher. It ought to be understood, Mr. Speaker, the basis on which the South Australia. The South Australian Premier Mr Brown and the South Australian Cabinet has purported to call this Royal Commission. In fact, uh, the Premier wrote to the Prime Minister uh, yesterday about this issue. He gave the Prime Minister of Australia an ultimatum uh, to respond within 48 hours. And the fact of the matter is that that ultimatum, um, that ultimatum uh, was presented to the Prime Minister at 1.45 p.m. Eastern Time yesterday. Now, I spoke with the South Australian Premier this morning <laughs> after the Premier had announced the government's decision in South Australia to establish an inquiry uh, with the powers of a Royal Commission. Now, he confirmed to me that the South Australian government's decision in this matter was taken despite the fact that no response had been received from uh, the Prime Minister to the ultimatum. He indicated that he acted on the basis of one unconfirmed uh, media report and indeed, after discussions with the Prime Minister's office, I can indicate that no such indication, uh, no such statement was made on behalf of the Prime Minister to any media outlet. Now, on the basis of that, the South Australian government is throwing around money uh, like a drunken sailor, issuing, issuing a Royal Commission with the, with, the powers, with the powers to compel an Australian Order. to come Order. forward and give evidence about their religious beliefs, an unprecedented abuse of government power. But, Mr Speaker, I want to turn finally to answer the last part Order. of the question that was Those raised by the member for Barker. The member for Barker was trying to hear the And throughout all of this, the fingers of the Liberal Party at the state and federal level are all over this issue. We saw the member for Barker and indeed the member for Mayo come into the parliament uh, yesterday and, in, and indeed wave this around as if it was some kind of holy writ. The great lie of Hindmarsh Island. And, and, and in fact, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the, the two key people who are uh, referred to in the basis of the allegations by the member for Barker are in fact Doug and Sarah Malera. And I'm going to table two transcripts, Mr. Speaker of what these two people said on the public record. I'm turning briefly just to two references to what they said. Mr Doug Malera, uh, who was put forward uh, by the Liberal Party as the, uh, the person who says that there's been a fabrication, yesterday spoke to Keith Conlon on Radio 3AW. And, he's, he's, and Malera, Doug Malera said, quote, yeah, I was a tool in helping it get it, get it uh, uh, brought out into the open now. Well, Conlon says, that's different, isn't it? Uh, if you've got to help bring it out in the open, that's different from fabricating it. Malera, no, I don't believe it was a fabrication. That's the basis of the, that's the, basis of the story. You can all read the rest because I've tabled the document. I've ta no, that's, that's why I've tabled it, because you don't want to think that because something's in the Adelaide Advertiser, it is true. Second, the, second, the second and final part of the transcript I wish to refer to Order. Is, Order. Is, is an interview, interview with Murray Nicholl by Sarah Malera. And the, the interviewer, Murray Nicholl, asks Sarah Malera the following. Let's look at the claim that he makes, i.e. her estranged husband, Doug, that he invented the story. Sarah Malera, yeah. Nicholl, can we have a look at that? Sarah Malera, yep. And, and is that claim accurate? Sarah Malera, no. Well, now, on the front page of the advertiser, says Murray Nicholl this morning, you were quoted as agreeing with what he said. Sarah Malera quoted. Nicholl, sorry. Sarah Malera, I wasn't the writer of it, so I don't say it because I didn't write it. If I wrote it, it would be different. Nicholl, yeah, that, that's OK. I mean, that's why I'm asking. Your name was put up in certain comments in the newspaper this morning on the front page. Answer, well, anyone can do that. Now, Mr Speaker, I conclude my answer uh, in this way. Throughout all of this issue, 
Order. I have endeavoured, Order. endeavoured at all times to act on the basis of legal advice and be fair to all concerned. And let me say on behalf of all those on the government side of this parliament, uh, we reject absolutely some draconian royal commission into the spiritual beliefs of any Australian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, Honourable, the Honourable Member for Dunkley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Housing and Regional Development. To celebrate uh, World Environment Day, the Minister launched a major report on how we can make our cities and towns greener places to live in. Can the Minister inform the House why it is so important that uh, we focus on an urban environment agenda in Australia and how this report will contribute to action? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Order, order. Those on my left, the Deputy Prime Minister has uh, to call. Mr. Speaker, I thank uh, the Honourable Member for Dunkley for his question. Uh, few members uh, of this Parliament uh, have a greater commitment uh, to the environment, both globally and locally, than the Member for Dunkley. And he has uh, considerable respect for his efforts. Order, order. Uh, firstly, uh, thank uh, the uh, member for his question because it enables me to uh, mention uh, Green Cities, a report uh, of the Urban and Regional Development Review, which opens up a range of issues concerning the environment and makes a number of proposals in terms of policy. And I think it's an important report and a report that uh, all members of the parliament uh, would benefit from reading. It's one that the government takes seriously and already uh, both in terms of greenhouse and coastal management, the government has taken significant initiatives to pursue issues that uh, touch on the environment of cities. For most people, the issues that are of greatest importance in terms of the environment are those that are closest to them. And so issues of uh, air and water, issues of uh, the quality of the local environment and so on are very, very important uh, issues. But I think also uh, the Honourable Member for Dunkley draws attention uh, to uh, the methodical way the government goes about developing policy, exposing that policy and encouraging debate within the community. And I think over time that's meant that the government has been able to produce the kind of significant reforms that the Prime Minister referred to earlier. But I think it also gives us the opportunity uh, to uh, draw attention to the opposition in terms of the absence of statements of policy, not necessarily statements of policy in books, but statements that are clearly set out opposition policy in terms of the environment, and therefore to leave a vacuum that is picked up uh, by members of the opposition who exploit that vacuum to put forward ideas in the name of the opposition that no one in this parliament would take seriously. I refer to the honourable member for Ringa, because only uh, a few days ago in the Australian we have put forward by him, presumably on behalf of the opposition, quite substantial thoughts. He contemplates the sale of telecom, and so the honourable member for Ringa says, "Well, we can start to use the proceeds. We can create," he says, "an environmental army, and we can have that environmental army led by uh, a general, by a commander." by um, a corps commander of high profile. He says, uh, well, it could be uh, the former governor of New South Wales. I guess that appeals to him as someone uh, of a monarchist. Or it could be Dick Smith, or it could be more or less anyone. And then he says, uh, we can use these resources from the sale of telecom to develop a project uh, that would be environmentally relevant. And so he develops an idea we don't know how many environmental projects can be completed with relatively unskilled labour, but chronic problems such as lack of tree cover, weed infestation, feral animals could be solved by enough people with shovels, mattocks, seeds, fencing material, passion bags, whatever. So the Honourable Member for Warringah steps into this policy vacuum, dreams up an idea worth some billion dollars, suggests that we get a corps commander to organise it and basically has people, the unemployed all around Australia, chasing cats down drains 
to, in, the, in the name of some kind of commitment to the environment. Now, frankly, in terms of World Environment Day and in terms of Her Majesty's opposition, we demand something better. But we've been demanding something better for years, and I think the fact that they don't have credibility out there in the community with the voters is not some technical legal issue, but it's essentially because, in terms of policy, they simply don't deliver. The Honourable Member for High Marsh. Order. My Order. My question without notice is to the Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Affairs. Minister, through your incompetence, the administration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander heritage has been severely undermined, perhaps irreparably. Order. No. Oh, no. 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 Order. Order. Title of put a question, and title of put a question, and having thrown the past in Aboriginal policy for so long, I mean the imputation is uh, most objectionable. The the leader of the opposition. Uh, um, on the point of order, Mr. Speaker, I mean uh, the uh, the purport of that point of order, and if, if it's upheld by you, is that it becomes impossible for uh, any questioner of the minister to include in that, in, in that um, uh, question any material which is critical of the minister. Now, if you no. uphold that, no. it will go beyond anything which has ever been remotely no, no. interpreted order. as part of our standing order. orders. No, no. Look, I think. I think the Leader of the Opposition knows that in, in terms of the way in which I have allowed questions to be put in this place, there has been an opportunity for material, whether it be critical or complementary, of people to be put. Uh, I'd ask the member for High Marsh to start her question again, uh, and uh, I'll listen carefully to it, but uh, I'm sure the Minister is prepared to respond. Minister, through your incompetence, the administration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander heritage has been severely undermined, perhaps irreparably. The Naranjiri people have been set one against another. Through all of the High Marsh Island saga, you have avoided the truth. Isn't it true, right. Isn't it true question... Minister, that through the High Marsh Island saga, you have avoided the truth, abused others in a cowardly way, and have now been forced to call an inquiry? No, look, look, I, th I think. I think the, the broad nature of your question, I think, needs to be addressed, but to, to specifically level some charges at the minister in that respect, I think, needs to have some fairly careful wording. Now, if you, if you, want, to, uh, if you want to take that further, I offer you the same opportunity under the standing orders, but otherwise I'd, I'd ask you just to simply look at the question's content and to reword it. Mr Speaker, I seek leave to move the motion of censure against the Minister for Aboriginal yeah, yeah, yeah. and Torres Strait Islander Affairs. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The... You can't even get an answer. It's day of sir. Oh, you overruling fees he's given leave. Well, leave is uh, given leave. Point of order. Uh, hang on, I'm just going to clarify. Speaker. I'll clarify. The Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, uh, the, le the Leader of the House gave leave if Callis Gallus wants to move this uh, against oh, the Order. Uh, he's entitled. Order. To the, order, withdraw the, that. the Prime Minister will help the House if you withdraw that uh, comment about the member. She sold the pass on the yeah. Aboriginal order, people, on order. every occasion, on every Thank you. The Leader of the House, we've clarified it, the Leader of the House has said OK it will, and, and that the government will take it. The Honourable Member for Hindmarsh will be heard under the standing orders. I move that this House. I move that this House censures the Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander yeah, Affairs yeah. for his failure to properly administer the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act 1984 in a fair and just way and through his incompetence, public confidence in administration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander heritage has oh, been severely right. undermined. Oh, yes. Order. Oh, signed. Order. Order. Signed forms? The Leader of the Opposition, oh, Deputy oh, Leader of the Opposition oh, is not oh, helping oh, his colleague at the dispatch box. The Prime Minister is interjecting in the most vicious way. Minister, the full May. today you issued a press release which... <laughs> Mr Speaker, today the Minister at the table, the Minister for Aboriginal Torres Strait Island Affairs, who is sitting there like a grinning monkey, <laughs> finding all funny. this highly amusing, if you take the order, Minister, who order. obviously, Mr Speaker, I warn fails... them. 
I warn the member for prospect. Name her. Name her. She defies you. Order. <laughs> the minister, who obviously finds Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander heritage such a joke that he has to sit there and grin and laugh at this. Order. Order. Those today, are my right. Today, this minister issued a statement that he will call an inquiry. Can we look at the context in which this inquiry has been called? It has been called after the South Australian government called their inquiry. We now, Mr Speaker, have the ludicrous situation that we have two inquiries into the High Marsh Island Bridge, one from the South Australian government and one instituted by this minister. Mr Speaker, I ask you what it says about this minister's competence that over a year after the original declaration, there are now currently two inquiries mooted into the whole Hindmarsh Island saga. I would, Mr Speaker, the uh, minister was given an opportunity yesterday by Premier Dean Brown to join in and contribute to the South Australian inquiry. He obviously was not prepared to do that. He sent you a letter. Order. The morning, minister will have his chance. There the was minister a letter have sent to the minister, and I stand corrected if indeed he did not receive it yesterday but received it earlier today, inviting him to join in the South Australian inquiry. The minister instead has decided to call his own inquiry. He has, he has agreed that there is a need for inquiry. So there are two things here. The first of all, the South Australian inquiry, and now the minister, who refused to take part in that, has now agreed that there is a need to be an inquiry. And shall we have a look, Minister, exactly why there needs to be an inquiry and why this censure motion, Minister, has been brought against you and the way you have administered the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Act? Mr Speaker, the reason why this minister at the table, the Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs, has administered this act and brought Aboriginal heritage into disrepute all over the country. And, Mr Speaker, I must just say that that has been one of the worst things that has come out of that, this whole issue, that wherever you go now in Australia, people know about the saga of Hindmarsh Island. And when they talk about it, they say things about Aboriginal heritage. It was all made up, wasn't it? Tell us about it. Now, this is what has happened. The minister at the table, Mr Speaker, has accused me of saying it was all made up. I would uh, remind the minister at the table, Mr Speaker, that I have said all along I did not know what the truth of this issue was. I have never said anything else, and I have sought from the minister a commitment from this minister for the truth. But the one thing that this minister has been frightened of has been the truth from the very beginning. First of all, if we can start at the beginning of the saga, the minister re refused to consider representations from Aboriginal men who disagreed with the business of the um, women's business of Alan Campbell. If this is not to say the minister will have his whether these representations shortly. were true or not, Mr. Speaker, but these people had a right to be heard, and this is what is essential to this. All people have the right to be heard. The minister at the table had that obligation to these Aboriginal people. He did not see, hear them. He refused to hear them. He was asked by the litigants in the case, the Chapmans, who, washed, who wished to build the marina, six times if he would see them and discuss it. He knew he would but bankrupt them by stopping the bridge, and he knew other marina and residential developments would have been scrapped and that the value of their blocks would have been gone down that $175 million were at stake, and he refused, Mr Speaker, to see that. Mr Speaker, the, the point of order is this, that this matter is currently the subject of an appeal before the full court of the Federal no, 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 Court of no, no, Australia. No, 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 just a minute. No, no. Uh, Minister. Well, and, and Mr Speaker, while uh, the robust nature of parliamentary debate in Australian public life mm. uh, means that it is obviously uh, 
scope for discussion of some matters. The issues that the honourable member is now canvassing are matters directly, I believe, within the domain of consideration of the full bench of the Federal Court of Australia. Look, um, I, no, I, yeah, uh, I, I believe there is. I have pertinent information to do with that. To further, deal to the point further to the point of order. Yeah, to further to the point of order. Further to sure. the point of order, Mr. Speaker. It is my understanding that the appeal before the court is on a narrow matter of law, on the description of the High Marsh Island area, and um, on the nature of the business before the declaration, and that is solely mm. the matter of appeal, and does not well, canvass this information. Look, uh, can I can I just say to both the minister and and the member for High Marsh, who I, I think are very genuine in their re in response to this issue that uh, the question of, of the subjudice principle here is one which I'm very acutely conscious of, and, of, and given that uh, this is a matter that's been put forward, I think, three times this week for consideration as an MPI, I've uh, had a look at some of the issues contained here. Um, it's, it's a very difficult thing to, to rule on in the parliament. There is a, a lot of information that's out there in the general public about the issue. Uh, the minister has indicated in question time today that there's a, a, an inquiry that he's established. I understand again that there's an inquiry that the South Australian government is intending to, to put in place or has put in place. And to that extent, uh, it's very difficult for me to therefore say what is or isn't subjudice under uh, those various inquiries. Now, I just say to members they want to, in their contributions, provided of course they are mindful of that. Uh, then they should be careful in what they say so that perhaps some new information which could possibly prejudice uh, the, the court case is not introduced in this place. But as I say, there's so much that's been written on this out there, uh, I suspect that uh, this debate can continue in the way it has. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Very briefly, Mr Speaker, on the Saunders report, which uh, the minister cons was um, considered, there were con things that Professor Saunders raised herself, the fact that she did not have an anthropologist present, an independent anthropologist. She raised that in her own report, that she had limited time, that she had only spoken briefly to two women and only had the information for one woman, from one woman. The minister knew that and, uh, aware of that, he did not read the 400 representations that were sent to him. And I think we have probably established that, that he did not have time to, that we have gone through the timeline. The Justice O'Loughlin found that the minister did not consider them. The minister keeps, uh, Mr Speaker, referring to um, the judgment of Dr. by Justice O'Loughlin and saying that he was vindicated. And may I just repeat that uh, what the uh, Justice O'Loughlin said, the minister did not give any consideration to representations at all. And the consequence of these findings is the conclusion that there has been a fundamental failure by the minister to comply with the statutory obligation that he consider the representations before deciding whether to exercise his power. Now that is clear, and yet this minister keeps saying Justice O'Loughlin has vindic vindicated him. So, um, so much for that. He did not. So he did not look at the representations. He did not. He did not consider them. Justice O'Loughlin then overturned your declaration, and that seems to be something we have forgotten. He overturned your declaration. And this is not the first time, is it? The minister at the table has had three declarations overturned. Well, one declaration overturned and one where he failed to make a declaration. When the Premier of, South Australia, when the Premier of Western Australia did not want him to, he did not make a declaration in favour of Aboriginal people and the law overturned that and the federal court said he had to. We still have the Broome Crocodile, Broome Crocodile case under review in which the minister's declaration was again overturned. So here is a minister who has three declarations overturned. What does that say about the minister's competence in administering the Aboriginal Heritage Act? We have Justice O'Loughlin saying in the Hindmarsh Island case he did not read the representations. Post Justice O'Loughlin's decision, and not amounts of information have come up via the media, which this minister has chosen to ignore. At any time, he had the option to say, "Enough is enough. It is time that we got this out of the press. We stopped the harm to Aboriginal heritage, to Aboriginal people, and get this out of the press into a judicial inquiry." But did the minister do that? 
First of all, we had an elderly lady, Laura Cartanini. She was the supposedly oldest Naranjiri woman and the responsible for the secrets. The minister never sought her evidence. And in fact, when a letter came claiming that Nana Narajiri did not know anything of the secret women's business, it was ignored. It was later accused that this letter was not written by the person claimed, but was a hoax or a fake by somebody else, in fact, uh, Alan Campbell. But did the minister do anything at that stage to settle this question? No. He did nothing. He left it open. Did Nana Cataneri write that letter? Did Alan Campbell forge it? We don't know. The fact that these questions remain unanswered starts to cast this big question over the whole of the Aboriginal heritage issue and puts Aboriginal people against Aboriginal people. You can't deny that. You cannot. Secondly, you can't. we have Nor is it three Naranjiri women it go on television. The first of these, the spokesperson, Dorothy Wilson. Dorothy Wilson says she was at the hut, the meeting, where a white lawyer put forward the women's business and she said it was fabricated at that time. Now, what a blow is this to Aboriginal heritage that somebody would say that? Is Dorothy Wilson telling the truth? I don't know. But neither does Mr Tickner know. If she is not, then she should be stopped from saying these things because they are harming Narajiri women. But if she is, then her accusations have to be investigated because they are casting aspersions on the whole of Aboriginal heritage around Australia. What does the minister do? Absolutely nothing. He doesn't investigate it. He washes his hand of it. Like Pontius Pilate, it's got nothing to do with me. Let the Naranjiri women tear themselves to pieces. That's all this minister does. He has allowed these women to be branded as outcasts and liars. These women who came forward, the minister has said nothing to defend them. He hasn't listened to them, and he's allowed these Aboriginal women to go unheard by the official channels. That is how much respect this minister at the table has for Aboriginal people. Order, order, order. The member for this Hyman has now the been in the papers be so for, well, for over a year Not at this stage. <laughs> we have had the women that um, the, the minister theory. has ignored. We then have questions about the anthropological evidence. We now have a public fight about whether the anthropologist who appeared for the Aboriginal legal, legal movement in South Australia was well enough qualified to give evidence, what was her role as she supported the women, and indeed then we had the leading South Australian anthropologist, the head of the South Australia's Museum of Anthropology, Philip Jones, saying that the whole thing was not true that from his experience it just did not exist. He debunked the whole thing. Now, at that stage, I would have thought, if nothing else, the minister, you would have said, look, enough is enough. Aboriginal heritage has suffered. I, as a minister, have, had, have a responsibility to look after Aboriginal heritage and make sure that these accusations do not go on time after time after time. But this minister ignored that too no reference to it. It has circulated right round Australia. So Hindmarsh Island is now infamous in the whole of Australia, and people all over Australia are now casting doubt on Aboriginal heritage in their own areas. Legitimate Aboriginal heritage is being questioned on the basis of what happened in Hindmarsh Island, what this minister the Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs could have stopped so much earlier on. We then have Douglas Miller, who went on radio, and I must, I think, get the quotes because the Minister, who has not been entirely honest in his quotes, quoted today from what um, Mr Milliner had said. 
in his interview. But he stopped short, didn't you, Minister? Didn't the Minister? I will table them, but first of all, let me read them. The um, transcript of the Channel 10 News on June 6, 1995, Doug Miller said, and I quote, I think the whole issue of the women's beliefs was fabricated. The minister did not quote that. He chose to quote from a 5AN interview the following morning. Now, I would put to you that if this minister was doing his duty, he would properly finish the quote, but he stopped early on in his quote. And I will read, Mr Speaker, to this House the, the final end to the interview that the minister read out. And the final end goes, Douglas Miller, that women's business is all fabricated. Codlin, the women made it up? Milliner, yes. That was the end of the interview the minister read out Didn't in question out? time. He admitted that. You are disgusting. Order. You didn't read that. Order. Order. You can tolerate someone who tries, but not someone who. Those on my left. What a fraud. Deception by omission. Keep your outrage under control. We then have. Member for Hindmarsh. We then have. Douglas Milliner's wife, Sarah Milliner, one of the key people in this issue. And yesterday morning, Sarah Milliner was quoted in the advertiser that it, she was quoted in the advertiser that it was all fabricated. It was an extensive interview. It covered one whole page almost and over the page of the advertiser. It was written by Colin James, who already has a Walkley Award. Mm. Now, the minister has said this wasn't true. Sarah Milliner later went on the radio, and indeed, it was a very confused report that she gave on the radio. I would be, if I was asking, if I was the minister, saying, what in the world is going on with this Aboriginal community well, that the poor women are being subject saying one thing the other day, one day, retracting it halfway the next. Isn't it time that this got out of a media circus and I, as minister, protected Aboriginal people? But that's not what the minister has done until forced into it by the South Australian government. From the very beginning, the Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Affairs has played this game as a political one. He has used it to vilify me in Aboriginal communities and for direct political Member gain. For Morton, just relax. He has suggested just relax. to Aboriginal communities that it is I who have denigrated Aboriginal beliefs, and yet he has not produced to those communities one statement to suggest exactly what I have said or in any way to show this. The only person who, has, who should be attacked in this for his failure to protect Aboriginal people, it is the minister. Yeah, yeah. The minister has, there have been serious charges in this case. The minister has avoided them, ignored them, and he has wiped his hands of them. And because of the minister's actions in this, Aboriginal heritage in Australia is now in disrepute. The Naradjuri women are separated. They are fighting amongst themselves. And the only person who can take responsibility of this is the man who failed to find out the truth, the man who failed to call an inquiry earlier, the man who should resign, the Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander yeah. Affairs. Yeah. Is the motion seconded? The Honourable Member for Barker. Speaker, and reserve my right to reply. The Honourable Minister for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs. <laughs> Oh, I might actually do that one day, start another speech like that. Mr Speaker, uh, having been furiously thrashed uh, with a feather by the member for Hindmarsh, I must say uh, uh, many of my, uh, my remarks uh, will not only respond to what the honourable member for Hindmarsh has said, but indeed canvas other matters of criticism that the opposition have levelled at me over recent days. Might I say that much of what we are discussing in this motion have already been uh, canvassed uh, in, uh, in debate uh, recently in this House. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the first point that I would like to make is that my obligations as the Federal Minister 
uh, to administer a piece of legislation that is uh, passed by the Parliament of the Commonwealth of Australia. And the responsibilities that I have under that legislation are indeed onerous. Uh, they uh, require me uh, to act impartially. They require me to act uh, prudently. They require me, in the case of uh, a, uh, an application for a Section 10 declaration to protect Aboriginal heritage, to commission an independent report. And in fact, my track record shows that in choosing the uh, independent reporters under the legislation, uh, that the people I choose are very much arm's length from me. They have included the former Liberal uh, Minister Fred Cheney, former Supreme Court Judge Hal Wooten and, of course, Professor Saunders herself. I should also say that not only is it my responsibility to uh, weigh up uh, what are sometimes competing interests in the administration of this heritage legislation, but it's also uh, my responsibility uh, to protect Aboriginal heritage. And indeed, the case of Brotho and Tickner in the federal court uh, placed very strong obligations on me as the federal minister uh, to protect that heritage. Uh, my role under that legislation has been consistently to try and find common ground wherever that can be found between uh, Aboriginal people and some uh, developers who might be proponents of a particular development. And indeed, the track record shows that in relation to the Broome Crocodile Farm, I attempted to achieve a mediation there. It wasn't possible because of the West Australian government and their intransigence on this issue. In the case of the, uh, the protection of the Todd River and the issue of a declaration there to pre prevent the construction of a dam, uh, I had attempted tr to try and secure agreement between the Northern Territory government and Aboriginal people. And of course, that came to a rather bitter end with the now legendary Max Ortman uh, in the bed of the Todd River. But I say these things, Mr. Speaker, because my administration of the Act is under criticism in the motion, this very political uh, motion, lacking in substance, but, but moved by the opposition. So it is important, I think, that I make some threshold remarks about the general administration of the Act. Can I also say, as I've said many times before, that the Federal legislation is legislation that is only effectively used as a last resort, that is, when state or territory legislation is inadequate or is inadequately applied. Can I turn now to the question of the Hindmarsh Island Bridge and the application that was made to me for heritage protection? Because in this case, as with all other cases, I uh, chose someone to commission a report who was totally at arm's length from me. And Professor Cheryl Saunders is, of course, an eminent Australian academic. Uh, the professor has been regrettably subject to, uh, I think, very unfair uh, and very damaging criticism uh, by the Leader of the Opposition and, indeed, uh, by other uh, members in this House, uh, Mr Aldred. And I think, uh, as the federal court said uh, in its judgment in relation to the uh, case uh, in relation to Hindmarsh Island, that she is a person uh, of very great integrity indeed, and the government rejects absolutely the slurs that have been made on her. Now, Mr Speaker, I'm not going to canvass the detail of matters that is uh, currently before the federal court. I mean, call me you know, a conservative lawyer if you like, but I st still have some regard for uh, the, the uh, judicial process, and I don't intend, I don't intend to uh, go into a whole range of issues that are in fact before the court. But let me make it clear that the attacks that have been made on me uh, in the course of the last two weeks have all been issues which have been the subject of a, ju a judicial inquiry. I'll repeat that. The attacks on me in relation to the, my administration of the Act concerning Hindmarsh Island have all been the subject of judicial consideration almost without exception. And let me tell you the kinds of issues that have been raised in the media and trotted out by uh, the shadow minister and the member for Barker, the member for Mayo and indeed the leader of the, oppos the, leader of the opposition Connor. himself. Pardon? No, no, no. The member for O'Connor, the member for Hindmarsh <coughs> was heard in absolute silence, as the will be the minister. The, the first, the first, and, and that's why, and that's why uh, I think it's fundamentally important, if the media are going to write about this issue, that they read the judgment of Mr Justice O'Loughlin. Because while that judgment uh, ultimately came against me on limited procedural points, uh, the arguments trotted out by the coalition 
have, were indeed trotted out, were argued in detail in the federal court. It was said, for example, that the fact that I issued a declaration for 25 years, uh, contrary to the initial advice from the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, uh, was somehow an abusive process. Rejected by the court, Mr Justice O'Loughlin said the decision was for me to make, and indeed I followed uh, the report of Professor Saunders on that issue. Uh, for days on end, we had only some sections of the media trot out the argument about some alleged impropriety concerning the tops of faxes being cut off. Well, anyone in the gallery who wants access to the transcript of the federal court can come to my office and get it, and you'll see that all these issues were raised in direct detail before the federal court. I mean, I've been subject to the most extraordinary uh, judicial consideration in respect of this matter. Um, the very uh, layout of my kitchen at my house was the subject of evidence given before the court, and of course the end, it was. And the end result of all this, of course, the, the, His Honour uh, did not uphold the assertions that were made. It was suggested because the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission had given some advice to the applicants about uh, matters within their responsibilities. That this showed somehow that I was biased or some impropriety on behalf of ATSIC, expressly rejected by the Federal Court of Australia. It was said by the coalition and you know, by a number of other people in the media and, and written up, might I say, uh, in the case of Mr Easdown, almost exclusively without any attempt to try and contact my office. I mean, page two stories in major selling tabloids uh, damning me without even the courtesy of a phone call. I mean, you know, I mean, in my public life, uh, I have an op obligation to uphold certain standards, as do members of the House. Uh, I would have thought the most fundamental code of, aspect of the code of ethics of a journalist was to get the truth right. But it was said that I had, in some way, in a number of uh, things, prejudged this matter because I had had a draft declaration prepared. Again, a matter expressly considered by Mr Justice O'Loughlin in the federal court, who, in fact, found that it was a prudent course of action uh, to adopt. It was said that because I took uh, action on behalf of the taxpayers of the Commonwealth of Australia to investigate whether the Commonwealth would incur any liability, that somehow or other that was an impropriety. Well, again, Mr Justice O'Loughlin uh, said that that was a proper course of action for a minister to take in the interests of taxpayers, and so it goes on and on and on. Now, Mr, uh, Mr. Uh, 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 Deputy Speaker, um, what I regret is uh, most of all is, is not the, the damage that the coalition campaign has done to me um, because uh, I have never had let me I have never well let me just say I have never had in all my years and there are many of them now in public life I've never had uh, such warmth and such a show of support not only from my colleagues in the Australian Labor Party but from people I care about in the Australian community, including the leadership of churches, uh, the leadership of community groups of great repute in, uh, throughout uh, indeed Adelaide and South Australia, uh, not only people in the trade union movement, but fair-minded Australians who, who respect uh, the way in which uh, this matter has been conducted. And let me take this opportunity to thank each and every one of those many people who have expressed that great support to me in the course of the last, uh, last couple of weeks as this campaign by the coalition was mounted. But again, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, right uh, to today and indeed yesterday, uh, I have uh, dealt with this matter with the utmost propriety. Let me say categorically that the decision to commission a further inquiry under the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act by Her Honour Justice Jane Matthews, President of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal and Deputy President of the National Native Title Tribunal. The decision to undertake that inquiry was categorically taken before uh, any suggestion of any inquiry or decision on the part of the South Australian Government to conduct uh, an inquiry. The decision was mine. I took the initiative, and the reason I took uh, that initiative, to be very blunt, and this is the saddest part of all, of this issue that uh, I became convinced that the coalition would continually uh, seek to use and to fuel uh, great division on this issue, uh, that they would continue to inflict great damage on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. They would continue as a calculated campaign uh, to try and discredit Aboriginal people and the heritage process. Now, in my right. remarks thus far, 
I have responded Order. in a very considered way in respect of a number of uh, process matters that have been raised in the course of debate. Uh, let me say, uh, in respect of um, uh, the politics of this, that no one ought to be under any misapprehension what is driving this process. I mean, what we're seeing here is the Adelaide Order. establishment uh, using every trick in the book, including a royal commission into the spiritual beliefs of Aboriginal people in South Australia, the Adelaide establishment using every trick in the book to strike back uh, at people who at least in some way contributed to the political demise of the member for Barker. Now, that's what this is all about. This is the absolute core of the issue. And we know indeed why the member for Mayo uh, is playing such an active role in this process, because he too is another wounded soldier of the Adelaide establishment, another fallen soldier uh, who indeed his, his own transgressions in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs uh, of policy were indeed the very reason uh, why he lost the high office that he once held. This is, has been from day one a political campaign of the coalition in which the Liberal Party has been uh, deeply involved. Its fingerprints are all over virtually all aspects of this grubby exercise. Now, let me say, in relation oh, to the inquiry that's been called, uh, I will be dealing uh, with that matter, uh, as I always do, in a proper and prudent manner. It will be an arm's length inquiry uh, from me. Uh, it will be an open and transparent inquiry. It will be conducted fairly. Uh, all those who have any possible interest uh, in the subject matter of this inquiry uh, will be able to present their views. Uh, but I do say this, that in the interests of good government in South Australia, uh, the Premier of South Australia uh, should, in fact, not proceed, not proceed uh, with the Royal Commission that he has already Order. announced. And the Prime Minister will be writing to Premier Brown uh, impressing upon him the concerns that the Commonwealth has about his foreshadowed uh, course of action and urging that the inquiry, the Royal Commission, uh, with power to compel people to give evidence about their spiritual beliefs, virtually unprecedented in Australian public life, uh, not be proceeded with, and that the South Australian Government cooperate with the Commonwealth Order. in respect of its inquiry uh, to end this matter uh, once and for all. Now, Order. Mr. The Honourable Members for O'Connor and Leichhardt. Mr Deputy Speaker, I earlier on tabled two transcripts in respect of radio interviews uh, given by two people uh, who were referred to in the Adelaide Advertiser and elsewhere as having claimed that beliefs were fabricated. And I did that in order to uh, hope that the media, who haven't uh, really had the opportunity to peruse these transcripts in detail until now, will at least set the record straight and that includes the Adelaide uh, Advertiser, uh, because uh, it seems to me that much of what has been written in recent days uh, about uh, the issue of Hindmarsh Island has been based on uh, really an, a lack of awareness about what the Federal Court has said in respect of this matter, and indeed uh, without the, the close scrutiny of a number of, uh, of clear rebuttals of allegations that have made, been made by the Coalition. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, let me conclude, if I can, uh, with a plea to the opposition. And I think at this particular point of time, uh, it's one that will not be heeded. But can I say that eight months after the promise of the Coalition Policy on Aboriginal Affairs, uh, we still have a total absence of any policy. And I will Order. urge the Coalition, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, to stop playing Order. politics with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, to stop using Order. Aboriginal Affairs as a party political football. Uh, to review your policy and to do so uh, with the good grace and decency and in the interests of this country to move to the greatest extent towards cross-party cooperation in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs. Now, that's not going to happen overnight, Order. but it ought to Order. in the interests of the, the nation. The Minister's time has expired. The Honourable Member for Barker. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Look, this censure motion is about uh, whether or not this minister should resign, and I'm saying that as the advertiser in, in, in Adelaide said this morning, he should resign. And it is time that uh, there's been a bit of shouting done about this matter in this chamber in the last few days. Uh, but I think there are some very quiet issues that I would like the minister to address. Now, he has said he has always sought to come try and bring together 
the parties, the Aboriginals and others in this matter. I think just I might uh, read out to you uh, a media release that Mrs Wendy Chapman put out some days ago. Now, and I have not spoken to the Chapmans, my office, my office has, but I have not spoken to the Chapmans until yesterday. Until yesterday. And, but I was reminded of this when I picked it up off my de desk because Mrs Chapman says in the six months before he banned the bridge, on six separate occasions we requested Mr Tickner to, for, to meet us to hear our case. Despite his own ministerial department advising him to meet us, he ignored us. He ignored us. Now, Mr Tickner, she says, strenuously resisted our lawyers' attempts to obtain, obtain copies of all relevant documents in the court case. And I said here in this place yesterday that on three occasions, three occasions discovery was attempted and something like six or more occasions there was a freedom of in information request and on almost all those occasions, not all, but almost those, all those occasions, it was resisted. And of course, in the end, uh, in some matters, his adviser said Mrs Ta Chapman uh, gave evidence, which she did, that some of the relevant documents had been destroyed. Now, two weeks ago, and this is the point I want this minister to address, which he has never discussed, and that's, this has nothing to do with the court case, this has nothing to do with the federal court appeal. Two weeks ago, the most serious allegations imaginable but were made by, that, by some people, by some very senior and very delightful people, that the women's business was a hoax. And they had to make a very serious decision whether they were going to sta stand up and say so in the face of their Naranjiri people. Have you, have you talked to them? I mean, has the minister talked to them? Of course he hasn't talked to them. He's had anybody ring them up from his department and say, look, you know, I mean, you've come out and given evidence. You've come out and given evidence that wasn't there before. Nothing to do with the court case. New evidence. People who, who are retiring, quiet. People who don't uh, take the public public eye. No, you have not. No, the minister has not. And why not? Because it has obviously put a hole in the declaration he made. And when you look when you look at that Sa Saunders report, and I don't think Cheryl Saunders, Professor Saunders, did a very good job. But I'm not accusing her. Of, met, of much because I'll tell you why she didn't have all the information. She did not have all the information, and I've raised this two or three times in this place. Why was it that the only woman, the only woman that was used as an original source of the women's business, that is, Nana Laura, an 88-year-old last year, perfectly healthy, known to the minister, had a letter in his in his in his hands in his office known to the minister's staff as being the only source, original source of this women's business information, was still alive last year and she wasn't asked. Now look up. Why don't you look up and face this question? She wasn't asked because Professor Saunders didn't know about it. She didn't know about it because obviously Doreen Cartnieri, who is obviously central to this whole thing, much quoted in the, Sa in the Saunders report, didn't tell her. Or if she did tell her, then Professor Saunders did a worse job than I think she did. And I don't think she did a very good job. But one of the reasons why she didn't know was the minister had her name in a letter, only person alive, others have been, others have been dead for 12 or 15 years, and, she was never, and her name was never told to Professor Saunders. And after the minister read the report, in the 30 hours he had to read the report, he knew, or his advisers knew, that her name never appeared in those 56 pages and none of your staff went to check. So the whole of the basis of the women's business, if it were true, had one central source alive. Ever asked by anybody? Answer? No. Why not? Ever checked by anybody in your staff? Why not? No. Don't know. Why would, why would, why would we know? I think the reason is that this minister had made up his mind of the general direction. And you know why he made up his mind of the general direction? Because he had a couple of letters. He had, that was one of them. One of the letters he had was one. The other one came from the first meeting, which was really quite seminal in this whole matter, which I raised the other day, and that was its sort of first public genesis, if you like, which, which was on the 9th of May on Hindmarsh Island. And at that meeting, 15 women were asked by the Lower Murray Aboriginal Heritage Committee to come down there and solve a problem for them. Now, what was the problem they had to solve? Mr Neil Draper, not 
not Nelly Draper, not a woman, a man, <coughs> Neil Draper, had just co completed a report for the South Australian government. And that report was not going to be good enough. That was their dilemma. That's what they told these 15 women. That report wasn't going to be good enough to get the bridge, the bridge ban, which was their objective, to get the bridge ban. So they said to the women, the women, you have to do something. And they brought Doreen Cartonieri down to the meeting from Adelaide, and she said, I know the answer. I know the answer. The answer is that that's where all our, our ancestors' babies were aborted when they were <laughs> got pregnant by white men. And so they wrote a letter. They wrote a letter to the minister, the first part of a letter, and they took it to the other side of the island where other people were, including the Aboriginal lawyer for the Aboriginal uh, Legal Rights Movement for South Australia, Tim Woolley, and he said to them, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. So another part was added to the letter later in the day. And what do you think that said? That was straight sentences out of Mr Neil Draper's report, a man. Mr. Ne whole sentences. And that was sent to the minister. Now, you'd think that anybody who was really cognizant of the fair result would have twigged that here was, were sentences, nothing to do with women's secret business, but have come out of a, a report written by a man. So after that, of course, with those two letters, one from Doreen Cartonieri saying uh, on the 12th of May, uh, the, the other one came on the 9th, the one on the 12th of May saying, you know, I've been aware of women's business for, for, for a long time, but I've just become aware recently of the exact place to which it refers, and referring to the three sources, two of whom are long dead and one still alive, uh, then he appointed Cheryl Saunders, a woman, of course, a woman, I'm not criticising that, to have a look, look into the women's business matters. Now, he has never, these, these matters aren't part of this court case. The court case is a, in a federal court, is a federal court appeal about procedure and whether the process was taken, took place correctly. And as one of my colleagues said to me, what ought to be addressed is, did that meeting take place? What happened at that meeting? What were the facts surrounding that? And did that meeting take place there on High Marsh Island with men, with men guiding the direction of the conversation? And that brings us, of course, to Doug Miller up, because he was there. And I have to back up the, the shadow minister who, who, who just put a, a, a hole through the, the veracity of this minister's uh, argument, or lack of it. The last thing that Doug Miller has said in a six-page interview, and a long interview with Keith Conlon on ABC Radio yesterday morning, and, 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 and false staff at the table tried to obfuscate this thing yesterday by, by reading stuff from early on, but the last things he said were this. Question from Conlon. And I think you said it last night, that you were the person who invented the story. Do you stand by that? Miller, yes, OK. If you want to, I tried to avoid this, but if you want to say that, I did invent it. OK. Miller then goes on to say, let everybody in South Australia know that I was the one, I was one of the instigators who created the story to stop the bridge. He wasn't asked to say that. He asked, volunteered that of his own information. So Conlon then says to him, What's that got to do with the understanding of women's business on Hindmarsh Island? Miller says the women's business is all fabricated. The women's business, the last thing he said, that's no, not the last thing he said, Conlon then said to him, the women made it up? Miller, yes. You want to talk any more because I'm getting sick of talking to you, says Miller. That is the end of the interview. So at the end of the whole of that stuff, six pages, he has asked the seminal question he said, yes, I fabricated it. So don't try and come in here and tell us some other story. Now let's look at a couple of other matters. Wendy Chapman says that, and, and I might say one more thing about Doug Miller. He was he was the central applicant in the in the uh, for the bridge ban. So you, one 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 has to recognise this. So last thing from Wendy Chapman. On the 10th of last year, Mr. Tickner made his bridge ban and was brought, and brought has brought down the whole crushing power of the Commonwealth onto my family based on his half-baked investigation. A few days later, our company went into liquidation as a result. Now, that's so much for you getting the people together, you know, the Aboriginals on one side and the others and, 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 and the white people and the de developer or investor on the other. So much for you getting those people together because she says she tried six times to get you together and you, and, 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 and you, wouldn't, and you wouldn't come to it. And I know I was amused when you said a minute ago 
that uh, you know some something about uh, this. Oh yes, uh, spending money like a drunken sailor. You said, well, my goodness me, as I understand it, the cost of your whole operation, the cost of your whole operation, will probably cost the Commonwealth millions, maybe tens of millions, in the end, of dollars. The Saunders inquiry, 250,000 is the estimate for the Saunders uh, uh, inquiry. Aboriginal applicants' legal costs, 100,000. Court case being judge, court staff, court costs, Mr. Tickner's costs, Aboriginal residents' costs, etc., 600,000. Full court appeal, 250,000. Minister's office internal costs being Sue Key's time and other staff, 100,000. ATSIC costs, 300,000, and so on and so on. Until, but moreover, all, on top of all of that, of course, is the loss to the developers. The loss to the developers. Now, I don't believe that these developers should be chosen over anybody else. But what is absolutely paramount is that this minister and a minister in this position who has the chance to make a declaration must make a declaration when he can get as close as possible to the truth. And what we now have is a whole lot of information which shows that what he may have thought was the truth, I think he was part of the conspiracy. I think, he, I think he was part of the. I mean, maybe unwilling, maybe unwilling, too stupid to know any better. But unwitting and unwitting, too stupid to be any better. But the fact of the matter is that when, when, you, read, when, you, read, when you read that Saunders report and knew that only four women said they knew anything out of 1,600, is it? Is it 2,000? How many women that those people claimed, and then there were other people who disputed, disputed the thing since then? You should have known better. Now, I might also say that on the subject, the other subject that I want to raise is when you when you take somebody's asset away, I mean when you acquire their their asset, not quite the same as a, as an acquisition of land, why do you as the government, with all the might of government, and the and the minister in in charge of government business uh, was was alluding to this? This, that, that my, my use of, of documents. I'll tell you why I use those documents. I mean, forget about the secret documents, because we might find that the secret documents have got as much authenticity as a promise from the Prime Minister inside them. Yet, Absolutely. that could be possible. That's the point. That's the main point. So, my use of these documents was because I knew, I knew, that this minister had not given up on discovery all the documents he should have he should have given up. And when I got those documents, it was patently obvious that he hadn't. Patently obvious that he hadn't. But let me, but let me ask, let me ask you. We talk about responsibility. There were 400 pages of representations came to you. 400 pages of representations came to you. And one of the people who made a representation, uh, Mr. Ian Weber, known to a lot of people in this room, been on government inquiries, head of them for the Labor Party and for the Liberal Party and other people, uh, chairman of Main Nicholas. He got a letter from. ATSIC saying, do you mind, uh, we've got an FOI uh, application, do you mind if we spread your financial details around? So he wrote to Professor Saunders and said, how is it that ATSIC has got a copy of my private representations which I wrote to you should, are only for you and the minister? Or words to that effect. Or words to that effect. So Professor Saunders said, I don't know. I don't know. I sent it to the minister. Now, I mean, I know, I know that there has been a change of arrangements from ATSI, but there were 400 pages of representations, and and not only that, when 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 uh, the the thing comes through, the letter comes through, the ATSIC letter says, well, we'd like to hear what you say, but we're not sure that we'll take any notice of it, even if you object. So all of his rep his private business is going to go any to anybody who puts in an FOI. Now, as it turns out, that FOI was probably from Chapman's lawyers because they wanted to see what the, the, the representations say. But if we, so we, we, we talk about, as this minister does time and time again, about handling pr things properly, he has not handled things properly. He has not gone into depth in this matter, and I think that he should resign, as, as the advertiser said this morning. And, and, and it's no good coming along with your own, with your own little inquiry again after a telephone call Order. from the Premier of Southern Australia. Member Barker's time has expired. Yeah. question is a motion moved by the Honourable Member for Hindmarsh be agreed to. The Honourable Leader of the House. The House should not accept this. They should not accept it for its content and it not, should, should not accept it for the motives behind it. We've gone to motive for some time now in these, in these debates in the chamber because this is about the fourth or fifth time that we've had one. 
And uh, as we've gone into them four or five times, these things have always been consistent elements of it. There has been a constant seeking, without evaluation, by the opposition of the information that is before them. They hear one thing and they rush to this chamber with a censure motion on the, uh, on the, uh, the Aboriginal Affairs Minister, and then usually a day or so later, when a bit of political prudence sort of indicated to that you wait, you get a repudiation of that proposition. And then you find out something else, you come rushing into the chamber with an, uh, with, uh, regarding yourselves as having yet another document or yet another statement that demonstrates the rectitude of your position. Again, you leave it without leaving it alone for a day or two to let, to let people dwell on what has been presented and let them dwell on what is alleged to have been said by them. You, uh, you race in here and you find some other reason on, that, on the basis of that unsubstantiated claim to attempt to censure the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. On every single occasion, including this one, and every single occasion, including this one, the so-called facts on which you have based your case have been muddied or repudiated outright. Every single occasion. And it all stems back to the first occasion. The first occasion you ran on this was not about your concern for the developers. You opposed the construction of the bridge. You are commercially stupid. And, uh, it's, uh, and it's not because you think that it uh, bankrupted the people who are concerned, they are in receivership before Mr Tickner got anywhere near the particular decision. So that was the second piece of falsification, I might say, in the, uh, the remarks that you made. That wasn't a matter of concern to you. You thought you had an opportunity, based on the fact that by accident a series of documents turned up in your office, not just the odd letter, but an absolute trove, a chestful of documents that were the entire legal case of the Commonwealth, not politics the entire legal case of the Commonwealth. You picked all of that up, you raced into this place, and then, frankly, you fibbed and deceived about those materials in this place. You made accusations against the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. Why you cannot, why you cannot stand and move motions in this place? You can get other people to move motions, but why you cannot, you cannot, but you nevertheless persist in doing so, is that your hands are so sullied by your initial performance. Mr Speaker, the honourable member's hands are so sullied by his initial performance as, uh, as far as this is concerned, that he has no credibility, no capacity to speak in this place. And I, always, I always had some vague respect for that, uh, that former uh, Nazi uh, minister Speyer on one ground only. When he was released after years of dissension, after being justifiably jailed for his heinous role in World War II, he was quizzed as he came out of jail. And the question was put to him by a journalist. What do you think about the latest Russian threat to our security? And his response to that was, with a political record like mine, why would you ask me for an opinion? Well, with a political record on this matter, like the honourable member for Barker has, why would anyone want to know his views? Because his original presentation was tainted, and tainted in the worst possible way for somebody who sought to stand up before the Governor General and swear an oath of office as a member of the Executive Council. A level of, uh, uh, of frittering around, frittering away a, uh, a set of, uh, of documents put before him which should have been taken straight back to the office. Now, I'm not absolutely certain. Like Senator Vanstone. Like Sen Senator Vanstone copped a similar trove. What did Senator Vanstone did? She handed it back. She didn't rock around the place trying to take advantage of what had been, what had been put before her. Uh, and you alone have managed a performance like that. With your political record, why on earth would anyone want to know what you think about this matter at all? You ought to be getting somebody else in, uh, in, uh, on the opposition side, if you must persist with these resolutions, to get up and do the job. Now, your leader may be trying to re rehabilitate you on this because he's got a pack of non-entities on his front bench, and you at least once had a reputation. You at least once had a reputation in the public. And, uh, and uh, it was a good reputation in the public. And uh, it's not surprising that uh, the Leader of the Opposition, with such a bunch of non-entities on his front bench, would want somebody who once had the reputation you had on the front bench. But the fact of the matter is that, uh, that you, on this matter anyway, are disqualified to speak, though you persist in doing so. What you have now persisted in, and I want to dwell on this to some extent, is the question of this Royal Commission. Let us understand this Royal Commission. There has only been one other, to my recollection, Royal Commission organised on what might be regarded as a religious matter. 
and that was the uh, Royal Commission into the Church of Scientology. And there was at least some argument at the stage as whether or not they were going through bad, uh, were, were purporting to be a religion, while in fact what they were involved in was, uh, was doubtful psychological practices. That was the issue of the day. So it usually had that rationale uh, behind acts that were associated with banning them. In this case, this is a royal commission simply into spiritual beliefs. It's not a royal commission into the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, his department or his handling of the issue. It's not a royal commission into that. There is, there, no royal commission in South Australia is empowered to investigate that anyway. And as far as I can see, Dean Brown has not been stupid enough in this uh, unprincipled act on his part to attempt to do something that is not within his power to do it. What he has done is target with star chamber powers, 16th century investigative powers, which is what royal commissions have, a group of women's religious beliefs. That is what he is doing. He is using a royal commission power which is generally used to get at uh, illegalities, corruption, at, uh, at manifest failures of public policy. It's not into public policy at all. It is into a group of women's spiritual beliefs. You talk about the whole might of the state and the chaplains. You talk about the whole might of the state and a court case which are run routinely anyway on appeals against this or that government decision at any point of time, a court case where rule, normal rules of evidence apply, where rules related to hearsay apply, where there is some level of discipline in what is put before them, you contrast that, the imposition of the state in that circumstance, with the putting in place of a 16th century star chamber to investigate the religious beliefs of a group of women in South Australia. This is an act of infamy that will go down into the records of, uh, of, of white black relationships in this country for many, many years to come. And you are part of it. You are part of that process which has produced this act of infamy. Now, ultimatums to prime ministers by pipsqueaks uh, suggesting to them that they've got 48 hours to respond will at the end of the day produce a foot firmly planted between their buttocks. But nevertheless, 48 hours was uh, the suggestion that uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Premier of South Australia had the prime, suggested to the Prime Minister that before he put this star chamber in to women's beliefs and Aboriginal women's beliefs in South Australia, before he put that star chamber in place, he said to the Prime Minister, over that 48 hours, uh, you perhaps would like to consider what you would intend to do. As it is, what he was running along with, as the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs has foreshadowed on many times, was his preparedness at, uh, at the completion of the judicial process that is currently underway to see a further judicial process in, instigated into not the women's beliefs per se, but into the way in which the determination was made and the grounds on which it was made. It's, it's something relevant, in other words, uh, to the issue of the day, as opposed to targeting them and their religious beliefs. He went, not on 48 hours. I mean, he might have anticipated what ought to be a prime ministerial response to, uh, to, such, to, to that, and he shot from the hip, went charging out, and stuck that royal commission in place stuck that Royal Commission in place. We now have a totally infamous situation, a totally infamous situation, as I said, where that, uh, where that has been. Uh, we now have a Royal Commission onto the religious commitments of a section of the Australian people. And, uh, now, it doesn't matter to the Liberals opposite, because they have that Midas touch, as I said yesterday. That Midas touch. They can, sing the, they can say the words, but they can't sing the song. They cannot, whatever they might say, when, they come down, when it comes down to dealing with issues that relate to Aboriginal affairs, they have a Midas touch of failure. They have an absolute Midas touch of every time when they're actually brought up to the mark, what comes out is vicious racism, vicious racism. And uh, that vicious racism is reflected here in, that, uh, in the only inquiry outside that Church of Scientology process the only royal commission on religion ever in Australian history. Now let us persist with some of these grounds on which they base. It's, on it's not a religion. It's on it is not order. a religion. Order. The women's Aboriginal order. beliefs order. are not order. a religion. Order. Well, all right.
Now let me. Uh, order. Point of order. Mr. The, the Honourable Leader of the House, wait just for a moment. Uh, as a matter of order. clarification, I said the Royal Commission's not on order. religion. Order. Now you're introducing debate. You can use yes. other forms of the House to the clarify the position is. later. The Leader of the House. Now let me let me go into some of these statements that have been made because all of this that you have chosen to feed off is related to uh, the, uh, the statements that are alleged to have been made by the, various, by the Millers in particular. And the Adelaide Advertiser ran that uh, vociferously, and you quoted them again uh, the, in the course of your remarks. So the Honourable Member for Barker quoted them again. Let me go through the comments today of Sarah Miller on all of this. and She is obviously a person being torn about by it. She had this to say about her former husband's views on whether or not it was fabricated. And he says, on weakness, she, she was asked uh, uh, when she was given a quote from her husband, what do you think of that, said Nicol, the interviewer. Miller discussed it. Why? And her, her remarks say, among other things, on weakness. It's time to back off because there is no way he would know about women's business. Number one, he would not know about business. I lived in the same house as him and he wouldn't know because I wouldn't degrade myself by telling him. He goes on, Nickel again. He said that you got carried away with the whole thing and got caught up in it. That's not so. So you stand by your claim that the stories are not invented. I stand by everything that happened, the right way, not the silly way, Burungi way. He goes on and says, uh, the, uh, so the information that has gone to Robert Tickner in the first place is accurate. The women's business material is accurate. Originally, yes. He goes on. Uh, Look, Nickel. Look, let me take you back. I have to keep coming back to this because it's turning out to be the central issue, whether you like it or not, that it's the woman's business. Now, there's no way I can ask you what it is. I simply ask you again. Doug's claim that the story about women's business, that the bridge stop was invented specifically to stop the bridge, is that accurate or is it wrong? That's absolutely stupid. That is a ridiculous thing I've heard. How can we not say things? We are Nanjari women. How can we be true? That's silly. That's not be true. That's silly. That's silly. That man's got no qualification to say that. Goes on. Well, originally, let's look at. Uh, so the uh, he uh, right. Oh, we're getting down to small bits and pieces, Nickel. I think the major issue still remains, doesn't it? Whether or not the women's business exists, you say emphatically that it does. Of course. Of course. If I don't, I don't, I want to know what qualifies a man to say. Now you had one quote at the end of a report which in fact started off with Doug Miller saying it wasn't fabricated. Now you have that. Five repudiations of, the notion of this person whose evidence on which you've been relying. Five repudiations that the story is, uh, is fabricated. You had a bit too to say about um, uh, the uh, academic Cheryl Saunders and what you actually thought of the academic Cyril Saunders. And uh, what you, of course, have to deal with when you look at what the academic Cheryl Saunders had to say about this is Justice O'Loughlin's view of Professor Saunders in his federal court judgment. He said, she performed her tasks professionally, dispassionately and with competence. I reject the aspersions which have been cast on her and the manner in which she's performed her duties. That was the view of uh, Justice O'Loughlin as far as Cheryl Saunders was concerned and her performance in this regard. Why did he arrive at his determination? Because you make some, something of the determination. Well, it goes to technicalities. One of the things that the judge believed evidently was that Mr Tickner should have read the secret women's business. That was the judge's view and the minister has quite rightly contested that view. Uh, given his understanding of the sensitivities of Aboriginal women to men reading their materials or, under, or knowing their materials, a decision which he, which I think is a, perfectly, a position of perfect integrity as far as the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs is concerned, he said, I will not do that. I will not do that. And he said, well, you should have done that. So Mr Tickner quite sensibly said, well, I appeal. I appeal on that particular proposition. That doesn't reflect badly on him. That doesn't suggest that he is incompetent. It just suggests he has a disagreement with the judge about what level of sensitivity ought to apply to women's business in, consideration by, in, in their consideration by men. That's all. That's all. So I uh, really, this, 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 is a, this is a concocted motion which covers the most serious impact on the civil liberties of Australian citizens in the creation of this Royal Commission. You deserve no credence for it. I move the motion be put. The question is that the motion be put. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think no. the ayes have it. No. 
Noes have a division required. Ring the bells. Lock the doors. The question is the motion should be put. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair and those to the left I point. Tell us for the ayes. The honourable members for Fowler and Port Adelaide. Tell us for the noes. The honourable members for Wannan and Riverina.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 71, no 60. The division is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the motion moved by the honourable member for Hindmarsh be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. No. Ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by the honourable member for Hindmarsh be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. Point tell us for the ayes, the honourable members for Wannan and Riverina. Tell us for the noes, the honourable members for Fowler and Port Adelaide. And the members for Karanga, Mite and Braddon were a bit lucky. Yeah. 
Order. The result of the division is ayes 60, noes 71. The division is therefore resolved in the negative. But honourable members, please resume their seats. Honourable Leader of the House. Motions be placed on the notice paper. I have one personal explanation from the honourable member for Goldstein. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We'll just get a bit of quiet for you. Members, please resume their seats or leave the chamber. Member for Goldstein. Mr Speaker, I seek to make a personal explanation. You claim to have been misrep misrepresented. I do. Please proceed. Uh, Mr Speaker, I have now had an opportunity to read the hansard of the comments of the Minister for Employment, Education and Training in question time yesterday. In relation to myself, the Minister made the following comment. He doctors every document that comes from my department. Unquote. Mr Speaker, this is a very serious charge and one which is totally untrue. I have never altered any document received from his department, and I ask the minister to withdraw this baseless allegation. The honourable member for Taney has a question for me. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, as Minister for Communications and the Arts, the member for Dobell has answered 74 questions on notice. But to answer them, he's on my arithmetic taken an average period for each question which exceeds the 90-day delinquency-free period allowed under Standing Order 150. The Minister has 14 questions outstanding, two since the 3rd of May 1994, a period of more than a year. Another of the 14 is question number 2128, which I asked him more than 90 days, 90 days ago. Would you please write to the Minister under the Standing Order and ask him to amend the error of his ways? I will write to him under the Standing Order relevant to the particular question at hand, and I would hope the Minister has taken note of your comments about uh, other questions. I present the Auditor General's Audit Report No. 31 of 1994-95 entitled Efficiency Audit Defence Contracting. The Honourable Leader of the House. Motion to authorise the publication and printing of the report. Leave is granted. Leave is granted. The Honourable Leader of the House. I move that one, this House authorises the publication of the Auditor General's Report No. 31 of 94-95 and two, the report be printed. The question is the motion be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, papers at table was listed on the schedule circulated honourable members earlier today. Details of the papers will be recorded in the votes and proceedings in Hansard. I move that the House take note of the following paper, Implications of Australian Defence Exports Government Response. The honourable member for somebody. <laughs> Fair enough. Move the debate be adjourned. I move the debate be adjourned. The question is the motion be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye. The country, no, I think the ayes have it.